Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I said a moment ago, we're going to be looking at our gospel text from Luke 23. If you've got your Bible with you, we invite you to open it up or turn it on, or you can follow along on the back of the announcements bulletin as we focus in particular on that last verse, verse 43, which says, And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, as we think of paradise, as you picture what paradise is, what comes to mind? What is the first thing you think of when you consider the word paradise? Is it uh, uh, white sandy beaches with soft crystal clear water as the ocean is slowly lapping and gently lapping the shore? What is paradise for you? Is it sitting in front of a big picture window, watching massive snowflakes fall down with a a blanket on your lap and a cup of hot chocolate and marshmallows? What is paradise for you? Is paradise strolling through a park as you watch the colorful leaves fall around you, holding the hand of somebody that you love? How would you define paradise? Or when you hear the word, what images conjure up in your mind? It's likely at least something that's beautiful or in a state of perfection. Something that brings peace to you. And that's what Jesus is promising today. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's an amazing thought to consider especially when it's coming from Jesus, the uh, the king of creation, the one who holds all of creation in his hands, as we read in the Colossians reading. Now, if you were listing the places of paradise, or or what would be top on your list of paradise to what would be the least uh, paradise-like, where would you put the cross? See, when we consider paradise, the cross is nowhere near that list. In fact... It's kind of ironic that Jesus is talking about paradise where we would expect to find it, or expect least to find it. And yet, as we see in our text, God works in odd ways. That the king of creation, uh, the creator of the world, is not wearing a crown of gold and and, and, uh, jewels, but instead a crown of thorns. That he just talks about paradise to come and the promise of paradise. And it's not some beautiful place that he is talking from. But instead he's talking about it hanging on a place of torture. A place of death. And really, the oddities of today isn't just in that one part. uh, But it's in the entire gospel text, isn't it? We, we read through Luke 23, and we heard about Good Friday, and it's easy for us to skip over it because, well, today's not Good Friday, is it? We only talk about this, we only hear about it, we only read this on that Good Friday day. Uh, what are we doing hearing about it today? Hearing about the uh, solemn attitude, the uh, uh, sorrow that is pervasive, the, uh, the kangaroo courts, the, the mob mentality, the march through the city streets, the dividing of the garments and giving everything away, the insults, the sarcasm that's proclaimed uh, even from the thief next to him. It's really an odd text to hear today on Christ the King Sunday, the day that's supposed to be about joy and celebration, that Jesus is alive, the King is on His throne, a day that we rejoice with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, singing praises to God and who He is. But our text is not celebratory, is it? Instead, we find the king in the most unlikely of places, hanging between two criminals, two commoners, two people you would least expect him to be between. And yet Jesus is the king. And he says kingly things. He says different things. He says odd things as he's hanging on the cross and says, Father, forgive them. As he is hanging on the cross and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. And... Once again, there's our word, isn't it? Paradise. What is paradise? Now, if you're thinking of paradise from the mindset of people who would be hearing it at Jesus' time, 
You're instantly starting to think about some of those great and grand gardens that the kings would have. For example, one of the greatest gardens ever was from the king of Persia. Now, being the king of Persia at the time, that was one of the most powerful nations, and it had all authority over that region. And so the king of Persia, he would have had the best of gardens, the best of parks, in the best of locations, with the best of gardeners, with the best of the plants that was well attended to. He would have had the place to play, to relax, to escape the problems of the world. And we experience that some even today when we go to the park. I don't know if I would advise you to go to the park to do that today, considering the snow and the wind and everything else that we're experiencing. But you can think back to going to a park this past summer. As you sit there, you can watch kids run around and play. You can see adults maybe exercising. Or if you're at Kids Kingdom, you can watch out for the golf balls that are flying around. As you're at the park, you can watch the squirrels run around and scurry around to find the nuts, to bury the nuts, to find food and have food throughout the winter season. A park is a place that when we go to today, it brings joy. You can even hear or maybe remember for some of you, your kids constantly saying, can we go to the park today? Can we go to Kids Kingdom today? There is something desirable about being in the park, in the garden. And when we hear about paradise, it calls us back to the first garden, to the first park. In fact, the word used for paradise by Jesus is the same word used to describe the Garden of Eden. For God himself is one who who likes to visit a garden. For as we look in Genesis chapter 1, we see about how he uh, walked in the garden, he played in the garden, he created in the garden. He even visited his creation as he would walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. You see, Adam and Eve, you and I, we were created by God for the garden. We were created to live there, to thrive there, to take care of it, even to be sustained by it. So when we're talking about paradise today, we're not talking about something imaginary, something in our minds that, oh, that seems beautiful. I would love to be there right now. When we talk about paradise, we're talking about the real, the tangible, the physical, that which is created by God and not just in our minds, but actually physically created. And on the cross, Jesus, through the cross, is pointing us back to that paradise that we were created for and pointing us ahead to that paradise that is going to be restored, that paradise to come. So Jesus... He's hanging there on the cross. He's got the two criminals surrounding him. Uh, The one begins to mock him, begins to blaspheme him, begins to antagonize him, joining with the crowds and the soldiers. And you remember the crowds and soldiers are saying, if you are the Christ, do this. If you are the Christ, do that. This guy, though, says it just a little bit differently. Verse 39, we read, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. See, this criminal is not saying, if you are the Christ. He's not saying, uh, are you really? Because I don't know. Everyone else is unsure, so I'm unsure as well. No, he says, aren't you the one? Aren't you the one we've been hearing about that's been promised to us? The one that we have heard stories of over the last three years. Aren't you him? Save yourself and save us. In other words... Jesus, I want paradise because I don't like hanging here. And you are the one that can fix it. So let's get down right now and let's create paradise right now. Let's fix the problem and here's the solution. Just get us all down and we can be done with this. Now, you and I, we've never hung from a cross. But we fall into the same temptation, don't we? I don't like the scenario that I'm in. I want paradise right now. I want something that's relaxing, something that's calming, and I'm going to do whatever I can to ensure that that is possible. I'm going to create my own paradise right here. So I need to make sure I'm in control, that I can maintain order, that I can predict the future or ensure the future happens just the way that I want it. I'm going to uh, set my rules, my standards, my time frame in order to create the perfect paradise right here. 
Sometimes that involves that we change the people that are around us. We change our jobs. We change our marriages. We change our cars. We change anything that's possible to be changed in order to create the perfect paradise. You want further evidence of this? What are one of the more popular types of games that are available uh, for computers or tablets or phones or whatever? Uh, but those uh, rea- uh, are, uh, what are they called? The RPG, the, the reality, Minecraft, that's what I'm trying to describe. Uh, Minecraft, or for those of us that are a little older, a Sim City. Those are the types of games where you can create whatever you want. This is your world, you design it, you control the people, you can craft it however you desire. It's built into our DNA. It is our desire to be the one in control. And I'm not saying those games are bad, in fact they're often pretty fun to play. But it's just further evidence of what our tendency is to create a paradise right here. The thief knew what he wanted. He wanted down. And down right now. He wanted to create paradise right now. The second thief, he rebukes the first. He says, don't you understand? You're under the same condemnation as this man. And us rightfully so because we've done what we did. But he, well, he didn't. Now, the second thief, he didn't want to be there either. I mean, who would really want to be hanging from a cross? But he recognized his sin. He recognized the consequences of what he has done. Now, sure, the second thief, he tried to create paradise too. That's what ultimately led him to the cross. He broke the law. He committed the crime in order to establish a more perfect place for him right now. And instead, he received the consequences of his actions. This is not a light sentence. In fact, he did something pretty egregious. But the second thief was different from the first. The second thief, he recognized his sin. He humbled himself. He repented and ultimately found forgiveness. As he declares, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The second thief knew that the world today, and we know this, the world today is nowhere near paradise. In fact, it's a pretty destroyed paradise. It's a pretty demented paradise as as it has fallen and broken and actually seems to hurt us more than help us. But Jesus, he gives the second thief that assurance. Today you will be with me in paradise. And he gives you and me that same assurance. In fact, all of Scripture is full of that assurance that God is going to restore paradise and draw us back into that paradise. And it's not just, again, an imaginary thing, but he gives us real, tangible, physical descriptions of what it will look like. For example, Ezekiel tells us this in chapter 36, the land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. God's promise to you is that the world as it is today is suddenly and someday going to be completely transformed and restored back to the Garden of Eden. That is what Jesus has come to do. In fact, it even continues into Revelation chapter 2. As we hear the promise from Jesus, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. God's paradise includes the place where the tree of life is found. It includes the Garden of Eden. You and I were created for that garden, and God is going to restore us back to there through Jesus. And every time we experience longings, every time we experience urges and desires for something more, something greater, when we begin to, our hearts start to stir in us and say, this this isn't it, this can't be it. That is the longing for this paradise that has been lost. That is our hearts calling out to us for Jesus and what he alone can provide. For he is paradise in the flesh. For through Jesus, the dead were raised. Through Jesus, the sick were healed. Through Jesus, those who were outcasted, isolated, and lonely finally find acceptance. Through Jesus, we see what paradise looks like. And the longing in our hearts is a drawing, of, of, uh, is a desire for us to be back in that paradise with him. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus assures the thief that on the cross. And he assures that to you and I this day. 
Now, if all we're talking about with this paradise to come is someday down the road, uh, that's great, but we're still going to miss the point. Because God's promise is not just to restore all things someday, but to restore them now. Jesus says, today I have brought you new life. And where do we see it today? But in fact, you've already seen it today. And the words that were proclaimed to you earlier, Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all of your sins. We have seen paradise every single time we come up to communion and hear the words, uh, take and eat, take and drink. This is the body and blood of Christ shed and broken for you. We experience uh, glimpses of paradise in the forgiveness of sins and in communion to come. But we experience the, the, the glimpse of paradise in other places as well. Whenever brothers and sisters dwell in unity, wherever love is found amongst the people of God, Jesus is present and he is working to create a paradise right now in anticipation of the greater one to come. Jesus is working to give us glimpses of paradise right now as he gives to us unexpected answers uh, to, uh, as he continually pours out immeasurably more than we can ever imagine or even ask for. He gives to us those uh, answered prayers, those uh, elements of health that are restored, that element of peace that get, begins to surpass all understanding. Whenever you experience any of that, Jesus is present and he is restoring paradise to you. Today we celebrate the king is on the, cross, is on the throne. And from that throne, he is calling to you today and every day to come to him, to draw near to him, until he calls on that last day to call you home for eternity. And when he calls you to paradise, he's not calling to you to come to a place with stunning snowfalls or beautiful beaches, but instead to see him and who he is, to experience this paradise that has been created for you from the beginning of time as God pours out his love upon you. And when we see Jesus, when we see him in the paradise of God, in the park of the king, there we will play for eternity as we rejoice with the angels and the archangels, and as we sing in glory to God for all that he has done to us and for us, as he gives to us this paradise promise throughout Scripture. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.